and it is hello from Castlepo. And uh, I trust you are all well. We have joined about a minute early. Um, we just want to make sure that you're receiving us and that you can hear us. Um, so um, welcome to the eForum on Clinical Reasoning and our tool and remediation program. And uh, I just want you to know that um, these slides will be posted on the website under events and then eForum. And we are also going to be posting the recording as well. So if you miss any part of it, um, please don't worry, you will be able to view it. So let us start. My name is Alex Carling and I am the Director of Professional Practice and Quality Assurance here at Castlepo. I am Samita Joglakar. I'm the Audiology Practice Advisor and the Manager of the Mentorship Program. And I am Sarah Chapman Jay, Advisor with Professional Practice and Quality Assurance. Terrific. <laughs> So um, we've got quite an agenda for you today, and um, we're going to be talking about the development of the tool, testing the effectiveness, using it, and then remediating clinical reasoning. And this has been a huge project mm. for us here at mm. the college. Um, I think we started maybe um, in about 2015, thinking mm -hmm. about it, 16, starting working on it. So um, it's taken us a fair few years mm -hmm. to get uh, from the beginning to the end. Mm. So I am going to start us off today and we're going to look at um, the development of the clinical reasoning tool. So, we first started looking at a process called chart-stimulated recall that we knew had been developed by physicians for training medical students and other um, uh, regulatory colleges were beginning to look at it. So we thought, well, we should as well. And the first two elements really spoke to mm. us, didn't they? Yeah. And that was identifying critical thinking and reasoning skills yeah. and stimulating reflective practice. So we felt these were two very important elements that could be missing from the peer assessment program, mm. from mentorship mm. um, and from professional conduct as well. So we embarked on developing a tool. And uh, we reached out to our colleagues um, from other colleges, actually across Canada, mm -hmm. um, for speech language pathology and audiology, and within Ontario for the other professions, and did find out that a lot of the colleges were using sort of different methods, but to evaluate registrants' cl clinical reasoning. And finally, you, the registrants, were telling us that this was a missing piece mm. in the peer assessment yeah. process. We send out surveys after every peer assessment, and here are some of the quotes. Mm. The chart review was fine, but I wanted more feedback and discussion about the charts. Mm. I feel my actual clinical work was not explored, and I'm looking forward to the addition of a more clinical part of the assessment process. And I think it's important to say at this moment that we're very lucky to have Sarah with us because not only is she a practice advisor here at the college, but she's also a peer assessor. Yeah. So you've lived and breathed all of these comments and reflections. Absolutely. And I think from both sides, for for you know the members out there and for us, this opportunity to have that discussion really adds to the site visit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And having Samita here as manager of mentorship yeah. is terrific because um, Samita, we are going to be incorporating the clinical reasoning tool yes. in, in some mm -hmm. way into yeah. the mentorship process. Yes. <laughs> so our goal in the development. It was to develop a, a reliable and valid tool to evaluate both professions clinical reasoning across all practice areas and to begin with it, it was part of a quality assurance program but it is expanding now 
So to begin with, what we decided we really needed to do was to develop a definition of clinical reasoning for CASELPO, for the professions of audiology and speech language pathology. So we did a tremendous amount of research on this. And we have come up with the definition that is in the guide mm -hmm. and it is in the clinical reasoning mm -hmm. tool. That is, clinical reasoning describes the process by which registrants collect and evaluate information, come to an understanding of a patient problem or situation, plan and implement interventions, evaluate outcomes and reflect on and learn from the process. So that is one sentence, but my goodness, uh, mm. a, a lot of integral information mm. as to what we see as clinical reasoning in mm. our two professions. So we were further challenged to come up with a definition of reasonable because an important part of a clinical reasoning tool is whether you can provide a reasonable rationale hmm. for what you did, for why you did what you did. Hmm. So what, it, what do we mean by reasonable? Hmm. So we again did a lot of research into the definition of reasonable and actually we had to go into law and legal research. That was the area where there was most information about what would be considered to be reasonable because that is used mm. in law. So this is what we came up with. It is what a hypothetical, typical registrant who exercises average care skill and judgment would do in similar circumstances and thereby serve as a comparative standard or a comparator. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this has been very important, certainly for the peer assessors mm -hmm. to really grasp. So we developed some drafts of the tool and we really felt it was essential to test the effectiveness. And this was a bit of a departure for mm. us. We had never done this before. So our first and early exercise was to look at the face and content validity. Is it actually measuring mm. clinical reasoning? Is mm. this tool measuring mm. clinical reasoning? Yeah. So we decided the best way to do this was to have a number of focus groups and um, Sarah you and I did a lot of these mm. and it was a very interesting yeah, exercise absolutely. wasn't it and yeah. we did ask the same questions for each of the focus groups and then we analyzed the responses so we had a focus group of managers and administrators mm. and then just randomly mm. selected registrants mm -hmm. Of course, we reached out to the university clinical yeah, educators absolutely. because they are the ones who are so knowledgeable mm. about clinical reasoning mm. and, and the teaching of clinical mm. reasoning. But we also reached out to those registrants who had just been peer assessed. So it, it was fresh in their minds. Mm. You know, mm. would this have been a good addition? Does this really get at um, clinical reasoning? And then we had um, a focus group of all of the peer assessors as well. And the groups, oh, they recommended really yeah. terrific changes and additions, which of course we incorporated. But most importantly, they agreed that the content of a clinical reasoning tool was valid. That is that it measures clinical reasoning. So, we thought we needed to test this in an authentic situation. So we are so grateful to those participants, um, audiologists and speech pathologists who participated in the 2017 peer assessment because they agreed to be part of this effectiveness testing. So thank you. Mm -hmm. We had 45 clinicians um, complete the clinical reasoning tool. We did three in French and 42 in English. 
there were nine audiologists, all of whom were providing services in a clinic setting. We had 36 speech language pathologists. And this really goes to the, we select randomly, because I mean, look at this, this mm. was amazing. Mm. That there <laughs> were nine who provided adult services, eight preschool services, nine services to the school boards, and 10 um, through what used to be called SHSS, School Health Support Services, LIMS and or private. Mm. So a real representation. Mm. So our methodology, we asked the um, clinicians and peer assessors to complete two clinical reasoning tools, one selected by the clinician mm. and another selected by the peer assessor. Mm. Both administrations of a tool were audio recorded and the peer assessor scored the tool. The audio files, and the scores were uploaded to our storage system that we use, Box, which is safe and secure. Hmm. We also asked um, the clinicians to complete a pre-site survey and a post-site survey. We then um, sent out a survey to each peer assessor as they completed it, um, the clinical reasoning tool, um, examining their confidence. We did inter-rater reliability, and of course, we looked at clinicians' con comments and peer assessor comments. Mm -hmm. So I do have um, this cartoon, and this is, a, it's a rather interesting phenomenon. Every time I press this lever, that postgraduate student breathes a sigh of relief. And I do have to say, when we started receiving all of um, the results coming in, um, we were so pleased, mm -hmm. you know, with the results, mm -hmm. which were across the board, but um, uh, I certainly breathed a sigh <laughs> of relief. So let's have a look at the results. So um, for the pre and post surveys, they measured um, their response on a five point Likert scale. And we used a two tailed t-test to measure the change between pre and post. And there was one question that showed a significant change from pre to post. And that is, do you think a measure of clinical reasoning skills can be valid hmm. that it actually measures clinical reasoning so that was very pleasing to see and reassuring <laughs> yes. absolutely yeah. um, that post there was a significant difference between post and pre mm -hmm. stating by the way that yes mm -hmm. they did think um, it was valid so on to the peer assessment confidence um, survey. And the question was, how confident are you in your determination of clinical reasoning of the, um, the clinician through using the tool? And um, the results were good. It was between confident mm. and very confident. Mm. So this was the really exciting element. Yeah. Now, Sarah, as the peer assessor, might not agree with this because <laughs> I do. Was excited. I was excited, but I do have to say it was a lot yeah. of work. And thank you very much to the peer assessors for doing this. So the audio recordings, we sent them out to a second peer assessor. They worked in the same area of practice, mm. and this was for scoring. Now, the peer assessors were not allowed to discuss their findings with each other. That was very important. So both peer assessors, the original and the second, scored, and the scores for each section were two if they um, had complete clinical reasoning, one if it was questionable, and 0.5 if it was inadequate in a specific area. And again, like that cartoon, mm -hmm. huge um, <laughs> excitement <laughs> and, um, and size relief. of relief mm -hmm. because the results showed good inter-rater reliability, which is terrific. Mm -hmm. Now, we went one step further. We really felt that this was important mm. and, and the three of us were involved in this. We did a calibration exercise with the peer assessors. This was in um, 2018 at their refresher day. 
The peer assessors listened to eight audio recordings showing good um, clinical reasoning, questionable and inadequate, and then they had to vote anonymously on what they determined, mm -hmm. you know, if it was yeah. good, um, questionable yeah. or inadequate. Yeah. And then there was a lot of discussion, yeah. um, uh, you know, and I, I think a lot of very good points came up. First of all, just listen to the content of the clinician's responses. Mm. Listen really carefully for um, evidence of clinical reasoning, because it is just a conversation. Mm -hmm. Then there was a big discussion of what is and what is not clinical reasoning. But there were some other variables to be aware of, and that is lack of preparation on behalf of the member, the part, uh, registrant, or atypical communication skills does not mean that the, the registrant is struggling with clinical reasoning. Mm. They're not prepared. Their communication mm. is atypical. Mm. But let's go back to the first one. Listen to the content of the clinician's responses. Mm -hmm. So out of the trial, mm. 43 clinicians were found to have clinical reasoning and two clinicians were found not to have clinical reasoning. Now, since that time, 128 registrants have completed 258 clinical reasoning um, tools in the peer assessment process. 1.5% of the registrants were found to need assistance or very good news. Ninety-eight point five. the bright side of things. Absolutely. Yeah. Clinicians demonstrated clinical reasoning. So, Sarah, yes. maybe you could take us through the next steps. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. So, as a result of this trial, uh, we moved on to um, have the council approve the clinical reasoning tool as part of the peer assessment process. So as of then, it's now a, a, an essential part of the peer assessment program. And the clinical reasoning tool and guide are posted on the website. So this is the part where I am excited as well, Alex, yes. that we get to share it with you and you as registrants can use it as well. Um, not, you know, outside of the peer assessment for process. For sure, for sure. There could be other very valuable ways it could be used. Um, I know I've used it just with a colleague, just as a way of discussing through maybe a, a complex um, patient that I'm yeah. working with. So mm -hmm. there's many options. Uh, also new in 2020 is that there is a clinical reasoning indicator that will be part of all of our uh, self-assessment tools. Mm -hmm. uh, today we are informing you obviously about the clinical reasoning tool. And also another element now is that we have just developed a clinical reasoning tool remediation program. So that has gone through the Quality Assurance Committee. They have approved it. And so this is a tool that we, uh, well, a program we also have. So we'll be able to share some of that with you. And finally, also, mm -hmm. and you mentioned it earlier, we are going to be um, having it implemented within the mentorship program as well. So yeah, Rita. in 2020. In 2020, so yes, lots of next steps. And, and I think what was interesting in the um, data we got back from those who had participated in peer mm. assessment is a lot of them said this will be really good for mentorship. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, and yeah. And that was unsolicited. Yeah. So that was yeah. uh, terrific. Very helpful. Mm. So we thought what we would like to do now, Alex is going to move the slides for us and we're actually going to help show you on the website um, what the clinical reasoning tool looks like. So you're going to find it under the registrant section, under quality assurance, in the peer assessment section. So there, are, we'll just show you the tool today, but you will also find the guide there as well. So this is what it looks like right now. So the, the guide absolutely takes you through what we're talking about today, the research behind it, how it works, how the peer assessor approaches it, how you as speech pathologists, audiologists, um, what would be expected of you. You see all the questions, there's no surprises hiding there. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you will see the questions abroad because they need to be, you know, that we acknowledge people working in different areas of practice. 
Um, not all all the um, sections will apply to each one of you in each in situation. So again, there's flexibility with the tool. You can skip questions. You might return to one section, um, and then as obviously from the peer assessor side, we are using it as a measure. So mm -hmm. for us, you will see, we are going to be going into the clinical reasoning processes and, and really what we're looking for when we're asking those questions. Okay, so we'll just slide down here. There are some key processes we're looking for at different stages of um, when you're providing service. So initially, have you collected sufficient information? Uh, and also that you can be collecting information throughout the uh, when, when you're working with people as well. Applying background information. Then also it's important how you link that information from one phase to another. Always taking the patient's context into consideration, again, so that they're part of all the decision making that's happening as well. And really being open-minded, flexible, considering the options. Are there reasonable rationale why you have decided to go a certain um, path? Okay. So here yeah. we have the tool, Sarah. Yeah. So again, um, in the matter of time. So again, you can access this at any time you wish. You can use it in any, t in you know, hopefully in a, a professional way, a way that will help you. Um, gain more information about clinical reasoning as well. So we'll give you a couple of examples. So the first one is a pretty open one. Briefly give me some background information about this patient. Now you might be looking at this and saying, well, wait a minute, what are those bullet points? What are those lovely boxes with C-A-L-P-C? So again, remember we've designed this for the peer assessment program. Um, program. So the initial question is an open one. If the person you're asking gives you the answer, mm -hmm. you can write comments there in that section. Um, if you feel like you need a bit more information, then you would go to the bullet points and you would say, well, tell me a bit more about the challenges or maybe highlight some of the interesting um, things that stood out to you when you were first maybe interviewing the person. And the C-A-L-P-C. -C. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So if we go back, we have these different processes, C for collected, A for applied, linked for linked, uh, sorry, L for linked, and PC for patient context. So typically in each of these questions, we have pulled out what the processes, which ones fit most yeah. with each of the questions. Number two, I have to say as a peer assessor is... Um, uh, usually a very open question as well, what is unique about the patient? Most mm -hmm. of us very happily and can talk about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're saying sometimes people answer, you'll see three, four, five, and six, just with the first, uh, second question, number two. But again, you can see the processes there. So again, this is a tool that you can use any way um, that you think it would apply in your situation. So and Alex is racing down here, which is good. We're just giving <laughs> some different examples as well. So, um, and you can also see in the blue comment area, now we've moved into the management, treatment, consultation, monitoring, discussion areas. So we've really gone from that sort of initial overview into assessment, into management, and finally it'll be discharge or follow-up. So this question, how did or will you decide to change? or move on to another section of the management plan. Again, some probes if needed. Uh, so far, I have to say most people, I, I rarely have to ask the probes, but you know, they're there again. Um, and we really like the final question because this is a self-reflection one. And it is knowing what you know now, is there anything you might do differently? So it's, you've, you've completed your, um, sessions with your patients and now you're reflecting back on how things went so yeah. as a peer assessor do, mm. does this engender um a, a lot of discussion and responses it can be very varied. quite honestly it can be very varied um i think the self it, it depends on so many factors doesn't it some some situations are very complex and i would say in that situation i mean and that's part of self-reflection that you are always considering and re-questioning what 
what path you've chosen and would there have been an alternative mm. so it is a great addition i think to this tour yeah and then um there is again remember this is sort of designed for peer assessors but could be useful the in for mentors Absolutely. mentees um so what we're doing and i i gave you the sort of um, the, so there's the overview, the screening assessment, management, discharge planning, and practice reflection. So those are kind of the five different areas. So it could be that they're not sufficient clinical reasoning in just one of those areas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that would sort of take a different remediation um, yeah. course compared to if there's concerns in many areas. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, if there's concerns, then there's a comment area and some examples below you as a peer assessor, we would be explaining why we feel it has not been sufficient. So maybe there isn't enough background information and we're going to take mm -hmm. you through some scenarios that will yeah. just mm -hmm. for you to get a feel for this as well. So I have to say, after seeing you explain that whole tool, yes. I can really see how useful it would be for uh two colleagues to use yeah. that you know yeah. in the workplace to have yeah. a discussion about a recent yeah. case and yes yeah. i mean we did talk earlier about how sometimes we're doing our what we do as clinicians in the workplace but we're not always thinking in, mm. a, in a, using that sort of critical reasoning mm. approach mm. and i think the tool is just so useful to bring that to the forefront mm -hmm. through those questions mm -hmm. you know mm. we were even thinking that actually if you wanted to you could do it on yourself oh yeah, you could, absolutely you could yeah. take a particular oh, uh, yes. chart a patient mm -hmm. and and just go through mm -hmm. the questions yourself and yeah. just sort of reflect yeah. uh, on on each of the questions yeah. Yeah. so yeah absolutely and of course we want to implement it in the mentorship program for yeah. the mentors to use yeah. with the mentees yeah. but in some conversations i've had with um slps and audiologists they've said that they have found it on the website and they yeah. have started using Excellent. it in good. the workplace yeah. and yeah. good so that's for you for those of you listening who mm -hmm. um have used it um, that's great to know mm -hmm. that you are using yeah. it yes. outside of the peer assessment program which it is now built into yeah so, so Samida, yeah. maybe you could take <laughs> us through some scenarios and polling questions. I'll, yes, I'll, I will. So we want to now that we've looked at the tool and what all of the questions are and the different mm. areas that it looks at, what we wanted to do was look at some actual questions and responses, mm -hmm. um, and and then put it out to you as a polling question: Is yeah. this sufficient clinical reasoning or not? Absolutely. So let's look at the first one. So the mm -hmm. question coming from the peer assessor here was, how did the background information you collected direct your assessment? And the response was, I always do an Arctic assessment with Arctic kids. Mm -hmm. So we want to put this out to you. Is this sufficient clinical reasoning? So we're launching the poll. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to um, Make a selection. Make a selection. Yes. Hmm. And uh, with all of these questions, we're going to have yes, no, or not sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've got quite a good percentage of voting. Mm -hmm. We'll just give you a few more moments to vote. And that's reassuring. People are able to vote. Yes. We yeah. always <laughs> like to see this part that you're engaged yes. and, and out there. This is fabulous. Yeah, terrific. So um, we're over 50%. So mm. uh, let's close and let's share the results with you. Yeah. Mm. So it looks so, like there was yeah. a bit of a mix, but the majority of people felt that mm. this was not sufficient. Mm. Um, let's talk a little bit about it, I guess. So, yeah. Whoops. This is me holding things up. That's fine. <laughs> we will talk about it while, oh, there we in go. fact, there we are, yeah. Alex, this is fantastic. So yes, yeah, so let's let's even look at some of these processes. Um, so how do we feel here? I mean, was there any flexibility there? No. Uh, did they mm. consider alternatives, different options? Um, consider the patient's context? So I think it's fairly minimal what we're seeing here. So. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's I always do an Arctic 
assessment. Mm. I always do this, mm. but there mm. wasn't much mm. thinking. Of... Maybe you might need an informal approach at some point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. The age of the child, what, pro you know, what difficulties, the level of difficulties they have. So lots Their of things to consider. Well, yeah. 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 So let's, let's look at another response. Mm. So the question was the same here. And the response was, the boy was outgoing and happy to go with me. He had reasonable attention. He was able to tolerate a formal articulation assessment, and I got the information I needed to develop a therapy plan. So mm. how do you all feel about that response? Was that sufficient clinical reasoning? People are thinking. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So uh, we're mm. having a quite a good turnout of the vote. Mm -hmm. So I will uh, close that now and share the results with you. Mm. And we've got 66 now saying yes, that it was mm -hmm. um, sufficient clinical reasoning. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Let's think about why maybe this was versus, you know, yeah. the first response versus yeah. this one. So certainly we've got more background information this time. Mm -hmm. um, we've got more of an idea of how the child is presenting. Um, and what their abilities are. So they have reasonable attention. We're already thinking, yes, they'll probably be able to go through with the test. Um, what else would you add here? I think I see some linking, like they, they're speaking yeah. about some of the, yeah. uh, the, the personality characteristics of this child and yeah. sort of linking that to the, the, the fact that they felt he would be able to do the assessment mm. and that they got information from the assessment mm -hmm. to then move on to the therapy plan. So mm -hmm. you can sort of see that they're mm -hmm. linking the information a bit better. And also they um, decided that because of the child's um, attention span, et cetera, mm -hmm. that um, their option of um, the formal uh, articulation assessment was going to be appropriate. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, in deciding that they, it, they must have thought is it going to be appropriate or mm. not? Mm -hmm. So right. they, um, you know, did so consider the option. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I actually quite like that there's an uncertainty here because I think what we need to say as well is this: there's no hard and fast rules here. We have to use our clinical reasoning. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not definitely you do this and then this. Yes. I mean, that's part of why we're professionals and we've been trained to explore what all the options are and the choices. I think that's a very good point, Sarah, yeah. because this tool isn't designed to test mm. uh, a speech pathologist or audiologist's um, choice mm. of what they did. It's, did you apply clinical reasoning? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you could get three audiologists three SLPs who would choose a slightly different approach mm -hmm. every time. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean to say it's right. It doesn't mean to say it's wrong. It's different. I think that's what's appealing yeah. about our profession. And, and we're dealing with individual unique people uh, as mm -hmm. patients, as students mm -hmm. every time. Mm -hmm. So it's not looking at that. It's looking at what was your clinical reasoning behind your decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, let's look at another one. Yes. So in this case, the question from, let's say, the peer assessor mm -hmm. is, what was unique mm -hmm. about this patient? And the mm -hmm. response was, nothing really. Mm -hmm. He was a typical 80-year-old with a hearing loss who needed hearing aids. Okay. So this is another polling question mm -hmm. for all of you watching. Was this sufficient clinical reasoning? Mm -hmm. It's also interesting seeing the questions we ask, how quick, you know, there's definite <laughs> responses or questionable ones. Yeah, that's good. So we've mm. got um, quite a few people who have responded mm -hmm. to this one. So I am actually going to close mm -hmm. and share the results with you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I would. Yeah. 
an interesting thing is, you know, this is a snapshot of the conversation. Mm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, up to this point, mm. maybe not. Mm. You know, yes. it's mm. not showing. What a good yet. point. Yes, but, Amita, what yeah. a good point. But maybe yes. with more questions, you mm -hmm. know, more probing from mm. the, the colleague, the peer assessor, mm. it would have been revealed. Like, yes. this is where they started. Yeah. Uh, nothing really, you know, but yeah. maybe with a few more questions, like, mm. can you tell me some unique characteristics mm -hmm. of this person? Some of yes. the questions that you went Absolutely. through, you know, the probing questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It might have been revealed more how they, you know, mm. how much information they collected, how did mm. they apply it, mm. how did they link it, you know, mm. did they take into account the patient's context, and Absolutely. so on. Absolutely, yeah. But so far, it's not, it hasn't been revealed yet no. in the conversation, <laughs> right? True. Um, I think we have another potential response to this mm. question. So what was unique about this patient? This time the response was the 80 year old patient with a hearing loss came from a large family who got together often. His wife said that he is isolating himself at family gatherings and not participating, which is not typical behavior for mm. him. She was concerned that he was missing out on important conversations. Absolutely. So we have a bit more information mm. there. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, have we put it as a polling question? Yes. Okay. okay, so let's see what everybody thinks. Was that, is this showing sufficient clinical reasoning as a response? And I think also we should say at this stage of the process, right? Because it's still at the initial um, interviewing background information. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So this so. is one of the two questions mm. that um, makes up the background section yeah. right the at the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, mm. so we've uh, had a good response. Mm. So I'm going to close that and share the results with you. Lovely. Mm. Yeah. So this time most of our um, colleagues out there have said yes they feel that that response was hmm. and i think yes we would be agreeing we with would you. Be agreeing with you. <laughs> yes yeah you Excellent. can see information was collected applied yeah. linked patient yeah. context was taken yeah. into account yeah yeah very nice so samida do you want mm. to take us through this next one yeah so here's another question so how did you decide to continue with or move on to another section of the management plan? Mm. That's the question. Yes. So the response from the SLP in this case was, this patient has advanced dementia and cannot tolerate a texture upgrade. There are real safety issues. However, the dietitian and I met with the family to discuss what foods she liked and disliked, and we monitor her intake. The dietitian and I meet at weekly rounds to discuss the patient, and we do joint reassessments when nursing inform us there is an issue. So, um, so let's ask. I've gone wrong. Oh, oh, <laughs> Give oh we forgot some to patience. Hide. Right. Okay. So, um, I am now going to correct myself. Yay! There we go. Uh, and I'm launching. Opportunity to vote again. Yes. Yeah. So, is this sufficient? Mm -hmm. Next. I know people can't see it, but they probably remember from when I read it out. Yes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so we'll close the poll and share the results. Excellent. So this time you can see 94% are going with yes. And because we've now moved into the management section of the questions, actually mm. now a lot of the processes will apply in this situation. So, um, it, it's about collecting sufficient information, um, applying the information, yeah. making the links between assessment to management, yeah. being flexible, having options, patient context and focus, um, and the rationale. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and also the fact um, in the patient's context and also the family's context, because mm. no patient is, yeah. is an entity unto themselves, so yeah. they consulted the family. And, yeah and uh, yeah. there was uh, collaboration. I also think, you know, through going through these scenarios, hopefully it shows that although this is a tool, it's, it's a guided conversation. The tool mm. helps 
all of us, if we're doing mm. this, mm. Um, to guide us through a good conversation mm -hmm. of what we mm -hmm. did, uh, you know, um, why we did what we did. Yeah. And I think it's important to stress it's a conversation and that we're not necessarily looking for this in the chart, in a patient record. In the documentation. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, I like what you're saying mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it's, I mean, you're documenting what you've done. But in the record records, you're not writing down why, why you have no, done it. No. Um, and I, that's why I think people really enjoy this as part of the site visit too. Yes. Because they get to actually discuss yes. why they chose what yes. they chose. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. In the beginning, you said that was where maybe people's comments were coming from. That mm. during the peer assessment, yeah. they looked at my chart. Yes. yes. But we didn't really yeah. discuss what I do yeah. and it why I do it. it. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. So this gives that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's much more interactive. Exactly. As well. Yeah. I think we've got one more. Okay. Right. So and right. I, I don't think we're going to do a polling on this one. Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> it's, it's the same question as before from mm. the from mm. the tool from the peer assessor, and this time the response is, um, she's got a severe swallowing problem and dementia, so we haven't moved on. Mm. 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 So that is fact. Mm. that it's not clinical reasoning right just you know right. to support that. right right yeah right. yeah and and i don't see the flexibility there no. at all you no. know uh, we won't even go into the processes but yeah. there's yeah. a number well, actually yeah. we can <laughs> we could we could actually okay so yeah so, no yeah. flexibility in the approach no there. options uh, not considering not taking options yeah. yeah and yeah reasonable not a reasonable no. rationale right mm. okay so, Sarah, this brings us to this section now. Um, certainly, from our perspective, how are we approaching remediating clinical reasoning? And again, um, as you've seen, sometimes it could, it's not just in one area, it could be in more than one area. Uh, it will differ from person to person, different areas of practice, what your practice involves. So, also how we're going to approach this, what kind of remediation would be um, provided depends on each individual. So when Alex started off and talking about the research, of course, there's been lots and lots of research on how to teach clinical reasoning to students. That's such a core part of what we've all yeah. learned when yeah. we were in school. But the challenge for the Quality Assurance Committee is having to come up with a program for experienced mm -hmm. uh, professionals who, it's being recognized, may need some additional help in this area. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then we had to look at coming up with a solution that is going to work more for the experienced yeah. professionals. We wanted to apply adult learning principles to this. We incorporated this in the program that we've developed wanting to make it as very self-directed, very individualized as possible, making it very relevant, very practical, um, really finding ways to learn by doing it mm. and respecting where the clinician is coming from and building on their successes. What are they already doing well? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yes. So from the Quality Assurance Committee point of view and the program, this remediation program will involve a trained peer coach so it will be another speech pathologist or audiologist usually in the same area of practice yeah. mm -hmm. that would work with that clinician in their place of work using their their patients um, you know for this uh, remediation and it is the quality assurance committee's decision on the length of time for this program so that would all be laid out by the committee so uh, a big part of this remediation program really is focusing on critical thinking, uh, being able to think ahead, think actually in the moment, in the inaction, and we've talked about the reflection piece also key, being able to think back. Mm -hmm. uh, when we reflect, it's a, I think that's something maybe as experienced clinicians, uh, you mentioned it earlier, we don't always get that opportunity now to to reflect back. You're on to the next patient, the next patient, and mm, you know yeah. you're working, working, working. Uh, I mean, sometimes I'll be driving home at the end of the night, and suddenly it's going through my head. I'm like, yes. oh yeah. yeah, what if I had totally. done something else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, um, but in this process, in the program, that's there's an opportunity to think out loud again using the tool, using the program to really um, that tacit knowledge that we have, it's much more explicit and 
really looking for solutions mm -hmm. and I th that's always what I really enjoyed yeah. about having a student uh, yes. it was always a challenge yes. but when they said why did you do that yes. mm -hmm. and hopefully they're also saying that really worked uh, but why did you yeah. do that yeah. and it challenges yeah. absolutely. you to think why did yeah. I do that yeah. how did you know yeah. how did that? I know how did absolutely. you do that yeah yeah, exactly. yeah. so um Really what we're saying is we, we're using um, constructs of self-direction and building on those successes. So that's sort of the starting point with the remediation program. Um, the clinician's going to review, select patient records where they have been successful in their clinical reasoning. Um, so all the, all the processes we've, we've certainly been talking about for most of the, today, uh, collecting, applying information, linking information, patient context, options, flexibility, reasonable rationale. Mm -hmm. And I think this is very important about building on success, mm. but it might be a situation where if someone is really struggling, yeah. they might yeah. not be able to find evidence yes. for all of them. Hopefully yeah. for some of them, but maybe not for all of them. And, yeah. and that's yeah. why they're going and through the remediation. Exactly. Part of the role mm. for the peer coach yeah. Yeah. Um, to hopefully help highlight areas that need a boost, um, mm. could mm. be um, promoted or enhanced in some way. Yeah. So. The peer coach would then help that clinician through a series of questions, help problem solve, um, particularly if it's felt like it's not sufficient in certain areas. Now in the, the program, the remediation program we have, we have a number of practice scenarios um, that again could be a practice opportunity. So they wouldn't be as individualized, not no. like you know the, the clinician choosing their own patients mm -hmm. um, but I think that this is more where if more remediation is required we're going to use those scenarios as a practice way as well yeah. yes absolutely um, yeah. mm -hmm. and ultimately at the end of this peer coach um, time they would re-administer the clinical reasoning tool uh, with the aim that, that that clinical reasoning has really been enhanced mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Mm. So we do have a couple of examples of these practice scenarios. And and as Sarah just said, it's um, it's to help them learn, develop, to develop these skills if mm. they are struggling. And these clinical scenarios will hopefully trigger critical and reflective thinking mm. and problem solving. So mm. we've got one for SLP and one for um, audiology. Mm. So this is the scenario that would be used in the remediation program. A very young child has been referred for language delay. Mm. The child arrives at the assessment with her father. The father spoke Ukrainian and was adamant that his child speak Ukrainian at home. So how is this new piece of clinical information mm going to impact on your clinical reasoning and decision making and then mm -hmm. um, the um, clinician and the peer assessor mm -hmm. can have a good discussion maybe think about these questions mm -hmm. what further information would you collect and, and going through you can mm -hmm. see the questions here but you know a, a very interactive session to really help um, develop those critical um, thinking skills and mm -hmm. problem solving skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then one for the audiologists, and we thought this was interesting, mm -hmm. didn't we, Samida? Because yesterday yeah. we were um, uh, 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 mm -hmm. absolutely with um, audiologists and they were talking about this this very mm. um, scenario. Mm. So a 15 year old boy is culturally deaf and the mother wants to pursue cochlear implants. You are not sure from the 15 year old's response mm. if this is what he wants. Mm -hmm. So what further information would you collect? You know, what is the unique patient context, etc. Mm -hmm. So these questions will just help to mm -hmm. uh, work on these skills. Mm -hmm. So um, we do have a little bit of time for questions. So I am going to go to the question pane. 
Oh, I like that question. Okay, so maybe the <laughs> first one, um, Sarah, you could tell everyone the question. Okay, so I'm going to read the question it. aloud. So it said, did the trial team find the clinical reasoning tool took a minimum amount of time? Or what was the average time it took to complete? And I love that question because that was part of the area I had to research. So I listened to, what was it, 258 of the um, clinical reasoning tools. It was amazing. The shortest time was four minutes. And I want to say the longest time was 32 minutes. And um, the average was about 12, 12 minutes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's a very, um, it's a tool that can be easy to use for that reason, really. It's not going to take three hours or anything like that and, yeah. and effective. So hopefully that helps answer that question. Mm -hmm. And we have another question. Um, this is a good question. Um, what are the criteria mm. for selecting a peer coach mm. um, who would take the registrant, the clinician through the remediation program? Well, um, uh, this is a good opportunity for us to remind all of you mm. um, that we are here at the college looking for people to join the college in various roles, including mentors, mm -hmm. becoming mentors, yes. um, peer assessors, mm -hmm. but also mm. peer coaches. So there are some requirements. Um, first of all, um, we would um, need a peer coach to have a minimum of four years experience. They would have to be in good standing and then they would have to be willing to come in and to be trained. So um, Sarah um, and I would train um, the peer coaches. Um, Samida would train a, a mentor mm -hmm. who was having to do maybe some clinical reasoning remediation in the mentorship process. Yes. So, but we actually will use the same program which Sarah mm -hmm. showed you highlights of today. So, um, and then, um, uh, so that would be really the criteria um, and you would be trained and then you would um, go out uh, uh, for a number of visits. Now, the number of visits, as Sarah was saying, could well be predetermined by the Quality mm. Assurance Committee mm. as the number of clinical reasoning tools to now show that you are meeting the standard of clinical reasoning. Mm. They might want two or three, mm. they might want five, you know, we don't know. Um, so mm. that would be that. So there is another question. Mm. So uh, Samita, do you yeah. want to read out this next question? Sure. So it says, you said you weren't necessarily looking for clinical reasoning in our documentation, but are there elements you recommend we include? Yeah, yeah. that's the end. Are there elements you recommend we include? I'm assuming in the documentation. In the documentation, is it? documentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That they're yeah. not looking for. You're not necessarily in the peer assessment process. I think we mentioned that yeah. it, you may not see it in the documentation. Yeah. You're not looking for it there. But right. I guess the question is, do yeah. we recommend that they include yeah. some elements of it in there? Okay. So I'm also reading. You know, they're asking, what do we include in documentation? So there's certainly checklists in the uh, self-assessment tool about what is required through the records regulation yeah. mm -hmm. that we would always want to see. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the nature of the assessment. Um, you know, your um, each clinical finding. Clinical findings, recommendations, recommendations um, referrals. You, you know, consent. you've recommended each consent, consent given informed by the consent. So there's definitely a checklist that you can access yeah. on the website and at the SAT. So with regard to documenting your clinical reasoning, I think it's in those situations where you really have to think of different options because of the uniqueness of the individual. So let's take mm. that child for the articulation assessment. Mm. So um, our scenario said that he was outgoing, um, mm. he had good attention, etc. So 
maybe you're going in to do your Arctic assessment and he doesn't really want to come with you. When he comes, um, his attention um, to task is, is not there. Yeah. Um, he maybe is all over the place or he could be extremely shy and withdrawn. Mm. And so you're not going to then be doing what you anticipated you were going mm. to do. Mm. So um, it could be that instead of doing any um, uh, formal assessment, that you do some informal assessment, maybe based around mm -hmm. play um, to maybe either focus the child or to draw the child out. Mm -hmm. So those are the times where you might want to document mm -hmm. because you're going in to mm -hmm. do your Arctic assessment. Mm -hmm. You know, you might want to document that you didn't do your formal articulation assessment because the child was very withdrawn or the mm. child's attention to task mm. Um, mm. was a challenge mm. or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Would you think I that's mean, again, reasonable? you know, this is where we're all using our own judgment, how much we were, you know, what we're writing in our docu documentation as well, mm -hmm. um, the, the amount. I'm conscious there's a couple other questions yes. hiding here. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Was there a demographic similarity among clinicians with better reasoning tools? So, Possibly if someone's more experienced, if they're in larger centers, mm. more specialized caseloads. Those yeah. are very good yeah. questions. And mm. actually, mm. <laughs> it's such a good question because yeah. it yeah. leads into a bit of a research project that mm. we're doing now mm. of looking at all of the peer assessments from the mm. last 10 years and mm. looking for different patterns um, uh, as you suggest, mm. um, you know, um, publicly funded versus a private single, because you can have a, a single clinician in a mm. publicly funded situation. Okay, like, like a sole charge. Sole yeah. charge, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, uh, so we're looking at that. Um, we're mm. looking at, you know, is it departments? Mm. Um, we're looking at, um, we would never look at age, but we would look at, at experience of mm. years of, of practice. Mm. So, um, and then, um, uh, so we're looking at, at, at this information, mm -hmm. um, mm. but really um, in, in the case of peer assessment, um, I would say it's it's fairly diverse at the moment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we would tailor it um, the remediation program to the unique needs of that individual, mm -hmm. the registrant. Mm -hmm. I think one thing we do always um, encourage is to stay connected. I think yeah. whatever area of practice, or if you're on your own versus with a group of people so important to stay connected with you know best practice evidence-based practice mm -hmm. um new approaches you know keep being open <laughs> to new learning as well which is all part of the self-assessment yes. tool too that yes we keep continuing our education so oh yeah, there's a il y a une question en français mm. en tant qu'orthophoniste et audiologiste francophone l'outil sera t traduit en français Yes. And so mm. is it going to be translated? Yes, yes. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So we will be yeah. doing that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And as Alex mentioned, yes, there are peer assessors who are French speakers who uh, certainly peer assessments are conducted in French as well as yes. English. And as the well. clinical right. reasoning tool yeah. is is conducted in French. Yeah. Uh, you know, even if you were bilingual, um, if it was your preference mm. to discuss your caseload in French. Um, uh, the clinical reasoning tool will be conducted in French. Mm -hmm. So, to hmm. be a peer coach is the expectation that we would have to travel to Toronto for training, hmm. or would there be an online option in the future? Okay, so um, I think for a peer coach, I am hmm. going to say that this would be one of those instances where we would want you to come to Toronto. Now, uh, you know, expenses would be paid. There is an also an honorarium. Mm. Um, but I think, Sarah, would you agree when um, Sarah does the training of clinical reasoning tool for the peer assessors, the new, for peer, the assessors. new peer assessors? And Samidia, <laughs> you're using that 
training mm -hmm. um, for um, mentors yeah. who are um, working with mentees who are having problems in this area. Mm -hmm. So I think we do, um, Sarah, you do quite a bit of discussion. I think it's and, the interactive part yeah. of it, which is very valuable. And a bit when you said we did that calibration exercise. So there are times, depending on the type of training, Certainly we do both, right? We yeah. do some online, but there's also in person as well. So yes, it depends on the and situation. And I think for a peer coach, this is being required by the Quality Assurance Committee. Um, it is not punitive. It is supportive and educational to help the registrant mm -hmm. meet the standard of clinical reasoning. But um, it, it, it's a significant step that the um, Quality Assurance Committee are taking mm -hmm. in order to protect the um, public. Mm -hmm. So would it not be great that the clinical reasoning tool is incorporated into every PMS? What do you think that is? <laughs> you might have to help practice us with the um, acronym. Like practice setting maybe? Being used across uh, Ontario so nothing is missed would also ensure uniformity of service. So we're not quite sure about what PMS is. I think it's more a comment on that the tool could be used for different purposes. Like outside of our outside professions of, yeah. as well, do you think? Or um, not sure, but... Um, I know that some people have been interested in using our tool for... Um, evaluations uh, uh, at your work, performance appraisals. Oh, like an internal audit or yes. something yeah. like that? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I've heard of people using it for that as yeah. well, yes. like yeah. using it yes. as an evaluation. Yeah. So if it's evaluation. a performance measure something. Oh, it could oh, be. performance Into, measure. Could yeah. be. Yeah. yeah. Be so uh, we apologize maybe, for us not knowing what this is. I think we have is. some space there where there might be a comment. Mm. Uh, patient, patient management, management system. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Um, if, I think that's a, oh, a site specific yes, decision, be, isn't yes. it? It wouldn't really be from a college uh, no, perspective. No, but no. absolutely, I mean, you could alert them to this as a tool. Yes. There's yes. lots of ways that it could hmm. be a place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Thank you for yeah. shedding light on that. <laughs> so that is all of the questions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to go on to our last and for uh, it's an important slide for us isn't it because if you ever have <laughs> Alex, a question yeah. <laughs> we really want you to reach out to us yeah. you've seen yeah. Samida um myself and Sarah today <laughs> yes. uh Samida can answer audiology uh, provide practice right. advice on French say, and English, uh, say English. And, mm -hmm. and David Beatty is our practice advisor for speech language pathology for French. So um, call us if you ever mm -hmm. have any um, questions or you want to discuss clinical reasoning. We mm -hmm. would love to hear from you. Yes. So our last slide for today is to thank you. And uh, we have some more information here um, about how to contact the college. Mm -hmm. So I think, everyone, it is time for us to say goodbye. And um, thank you very much for joining us. So I am now going to close down this webinar. Don't forget, it's going to be posted on the website along with the slides. Yes. Have a nice bye. afternoon. Bye-bye.